So again, he came in a few minutes late. My name is Alexis Clifton. I'm with uh, SUNY OER Services. And the best part of my job is working in rooms like this on campuses across SUNY um, with people up front. But also, if you know me for any length of time, you'll know that eventually I'm going to ask you to sit up front too. Um, so if I haven't asked you yet, it's coming. Um, as people in this row can attest to, but that's okay. They're, <laughs> they're all great advocates for this movement. Um, so, yeah, just a few minutes of um, people that have done this work within our system, no student populations here, no all of the complex administrative populations here, um, and what it takes to actually get OER and open pedagogy into the classroom. I have to get my phone so I can of take course. pictures because, you know, you're all going to be on Twitter. Yeah, and so you are about to be Twitter famous if you're not already. <laughs> um, is there any yeah. minds? Like, do you want to not be, have a photo? There's well, people okay. looking for me, so. You what? There's people looking for me. <laughs> They're going to find you. <laughs> um, so today we're very glad to be joined by some local campus experts here at Oswego, um, and also a couple of, uh, well, I'll let you tell, tell them, I'll let you introduce yourselves, because I'm really, I'm good with first names, I'm sort of okay with last names, depending on how much coffee I've had in the morning, and I'm terrible with titles, so, um, yeah, so it's better if you do the introductions yourself, but just quickly, this is, again, an interactive session, please toss questions their way, but uh, to get us started today, as a form of introduction, if you wouldn't mind telling us your name, your department, which school you're with, um, and um, like the first concrete step, once you got hooked on this open idea, what was the first thing that you did um, to take action towards your writing, your professionalism, your classroom? And Craig, you're sitting right okay. here. I'm Craig Delancey. I'm in the philosophy department here at SUNY Oswego. And uh, the first concrete step I took was to write a logic textbook that's open source. Uh, so you just went straight off that. Yeah, I went right to the big, what, what do we call it? Big deal textbook, I guess. <laughs> yes. I'm hoping it's a big deal. I don't know. Yeah. I'm Elizabeth Johnson. I'm a professor of English at Monroe Community College. And my first concrete step was looking for ways to have a print version of the open textbooks uh, for my composition courses in particular. I've gone all OER now. But I wanted students to have something <clears> in class that they could annotate and reference, and so um, that was my first step. How could I work with a print store, a print shop in the bookstore? And I'm sorry, did you do that with your local print shop there on campus? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, my name is Tori Matthews. I'm a professor of biology, also at Monroe Community College. Um, I teach a lot of different classes, so intro bio, gen bio, molecular genetics, A and P. Every single one of them has at least some component of OER now. And the first thing I always do is materials review. So I look at what's out there and see if it will work for my class. And if so, I think about how I can adopt it. Because the cool thing about biology is you don't have to really write anything new. You just got to ask yourself, is what's there good enough? And if not, you can just add to it. Hello, I'm Maya Brown. I'm an assistant professor here at SUNY Oswego in the theater department. And I was introduced to OER last year. I came to this workshop. Um, also, I met, yeah, <laughs> uh, Laura Harris, who helped me. Um, uh, like, I, I applied for an OER grant that they're doing through SUNY and received it for 2017, 2018. And so I adopted a textbook for my introduction to theater class, and we're creating a monologue database for my Shakespeare class. And both of those experiences have been unique. <laughs> and I could certainly answer some questions on creating, um, not a textbook, but <laughs> uh, this database, and we're still working on it. Uh, but it's been a really great opportunity for the students. They feel empowered because they're contributing to the work. And that's like been the best benefit that I've seen. Uh, my initial step was reading, <laughs> like lots of reading, trying to find the right textbook, and um, then just uh, creating assignments that would help us to fulfill the content, content that we need for this database. So lots of reading and creating assignments for me. Great. I'm Chris Munger, and I'm the Associate Dean in the School of Education here at SUNY Oswego. And the first concrete step I took was I edited an open textbook. 
and I had 10 co-authors. So when it, we talk about sharing the labor, um, there's ways to distribute and bring in the expertise of a lot of different folks. It wasn't all folks um, from where I was working, but from around different institutions in the, in the country. And then I also co-authored some of the chapters and I've become obsessed with open educational resources ever since. <laughs> Thank you for, yeah. And so it, it, it's a movement. It's absolutely a movement. And it, it just as a, a quick aside, like I've also been a part of many different networks, including on campus and off campus. And I remember going to a, a discussion through Cengage and some of the different publishers are trying to figure out how they can harness open educational resources but also get a market share because they're trying to figure out what we're not willing to do and so I'm hoping that thinking outside of the textbook but really thinking about all the things that were discussed this morning what are we willing to do and keep I guess moving in this direction so as part of the movement that's my plug <laughs> Hi, my name is Sofia Georgia Kaki. I'm a professor of mathematics at Tompkins Corland Community College. Uh, I have two first steps because I started very early in uh, for with uh, OER. So it was a nationwide grant in 2011, and basically brought OER in New York State, and now it has expanded. So at that time, the first concrete step we had to take was to identify what are the course learning outcomes so that we can find content. So we did find an OER and I had a terrible first semester experience uh, because I didn't have a platform where my students could practice. So in mathematics it is nice to have some kind of immediate feedback and have the student try it. So my first concrete step was to identify the course learning outcomes so that I could you know, reach out for content, content and research content. But the next concrete step that actually helped fly, you know, take off, uh, was to identify a platform, some kind of web platform that we could use where our students could perform homework. Mm -hmm. Uh, Larry Chase, Tompkins, Cortland as well, uh, chair of the uh, business and sport management programs. Uh, my first concrete effort was uh, part of a similar grant about six months later. Uh, it was the development of a, an OER, Principles of Marketing textbook. Uh, pretty bizarre with all the technology that exists in the planet, uh, but uh, the Kaleidoscope program, now known as Lumen, any of you that are familiar with it, uh, flew us, me, and, and, and two people from the East Coast out to California. We're still trying to figure that one out. And uh, we created, uh, along with uh, Kim Thanos, who is uh, the uh, CEO of, uh, of Lumen and a tremendous proponent, friend of SUNY, uh, to develop that text. <coughs> and uh, later on, I hope I get a chance to uh, speak about uh, a very concrete effort, which was creating an entire program mm -hmm. uh, for uh, achieving the dream, uh, and uh, that uh, good success story for our our program and our college. I don't know if anybody will want to hear about that. I think <laughs> <laughs> building a whole degree program from the ground up. Yes, absolutely. We will come back to that definitely. Thank you. Um, so I've got to say. I talked to a lot of faculty and uh, coming from a lot of different backgrounds and perspectives, and um, I hear fairly routinely that, oh, that OER thing is great. It will work so good for this other department over here, but in my department, that just can't. You just can't do that, you know, for whatever reasons. Did you did you feel any of that yourselves as you were getting started, or what are the special considerations for your own disciplines that were the the touchstones and the hurdles and this is open to everybody, uh, you know, Sophie already kind of, you touched on the homework platform oh, and... <laughs> I have more of that. <laughs> um, but anybody, feel free to jump in there. So I can start. Um, so uh, mathematics is a little weird because uh, we get um, visits from uh, uh, publishers who basically have someone trained and ready to present the material to you. So it's a little hard for someone who teaches so, you know, so many courses and have an overload to actually have the time to do the investigation themselves. 
and the publishers just basically cater to you and say, oh, you want this, I have this book, or you want something else, I have this. Uh, so it is very nice to get the solution like served to you instead of looking for it. So my math department was very reluctant in joining. It took me five semesters to convince them, and I convinced them in two ways. First of all, my success went from 23% to 75%. That is C or above. We don't count people who get C minus. Uh, and my classes were filling up on day one, <laughs> registration day, with a wait list, and theirs were halfway there. <laughs> so there was a need and students started advocating, and that's how this thing became now it's a norm for the math. The math department was the first department to just go full scale OER, uh, not only in the course that I had developed, but they were actually willing to develop their own courses. So we have faculty now who develop statistics and uh, college algebra and pre-calculus, and I just started with intermediate algebra. So um, even your own department thinks it's not possible when they, there is somebody in the department that is doing it. I, I was yesterday uh, attending a talk and an English faculty said, this cannot happen in literature. She needs to talk to you. I, uh, <laughs> yes, it cannot happen in literature because this is a different uh, you know, beast. I can understand how it works for math, she said, and psychology, even, <laughs> but I cannot uh, do it in English. So yes, a lot of people, uh, because it's br a brand new idea, they don't think it's possible, but they, I don't think they have seen the potential of this. I was saying, thing, I, are there any literature for English people? So I will say, because some parts of that are true, right? Like if you teach contemporary American literature, those people are not going to give you the books for free, and you should mm -hmm. still buy them, right? I always tell people, like, I'm not against books, right? So they can buy books. <coughs> but like in a, a critical theory class that I used to teach, we would buy, because a lot of that theory is from the 60s and later, and so that's all copyrighted <coughs> material, sometimes by living authors. We would buy that material. Um, but my students still, uh, you know, we had like a ancillary book that would help translate the theory or whatever. We made OERs for that stuff. And, so it is true, like, you know, if you're reading, you know, books and monographs and whatever, where nobody's saying you can't buy that stuff. Mm -hmm. And you can still make a zero textbook degree cost program and still have costs for learning materials as long as the commercial textbooks are not sort of a part of that. So it's all about how you honestly represent what you're doing. Yes, and in mathematics, initially, there was no open calculator. So open. You know, you do you teach a functions class, people need to have a graphing calculator. That's 120 bucks if you're lucky. So, you know, tools get developed eventually as you go, and I believe, you know, there is uh, some development that still is there for us. Yeah. And now you are talking about, but I have a question. You are talking about your uh, rate of success. You have gone from 25% to 75%. What do you attribute it to? Uh, because is it just the book that you know you are writing for free? No. Or so when I use, when I use the, the book on the PDF, my success from twenty three percent went to six. <laughs> it was it was a very bad experience. As soon as we ended up with the open platform where students can do homework and interact, and actually our psychology uses that through the Carnegie Mellon Open Learning Initiative, which is a different platform altogether. Um, my success went up to 33%. So just by adopting a new book and by creating, you know, having the platform for exercises, you will not see something significant. You're changing a book. That's all you're doing. Once you contribute to the book is when things happen. So the, the fact that I have a network of people who I had never met, but I ended up meeting. We met in Denver in 2013, that's two years later. They asked me what content I was missing. I said I'm missing, you know, graphing of uh, two, uh, of uh, linear equations into variables. I'm missing functions. I'm missing this. They created content for me overnight. The next morning, the content was there. So this is <laughs> extremely helpful to actually have a network that is beyond your neighbor, someone who has the time, someone who has the resources, someone who maybe has the material already. These things happen really quickly. I was teaching a summer class 
the content that I was asking was not visible to my students yet, so they got a content in July that was created in June. So um, I was able to do that, and then what I do further down the road, uh, that was my initial semester, was if my students ask me a question more than two times on the same topic, I create material for the course, for them. I answer that specific question, I have a mini lecture, I videotape myself, I add notes in our workbook, I add uh, uh, pages in the textbook that maybe explain this better, so I add a bunch of stuff. So the, the course is actually dynamic even now after you know, we started in 2011 and we're still teaching the same course, the course is changes as we speak. If the students ask questions, I just add it. And it's a, it's a different experience depending on your topic. So in biology, um, it's weird for a different reason because our enemy is the fact that nothing has changed. And at the same time, that's our, like our greatest benefit too because you can go back to introductory biology for years. And in, in terms of our course learning outcomes, what we need to teach students, that foundation is the same, right? So because it's the same, if you've been doing it for years, then you have everything worked out. All right, you got your PowerPoints all set, you know where to send them in the chapters in the book. So you don't want to change that if it's really no benefit to you, right? Because then you got to go back and rework your PowerPoints and all this stuff. So, you know, I was a new faculty member. So I think that's why it was easier for me. Uh, first, I, I am a, a neurobiologist by training. So I've only been teaching full time for like the past five years. So I do come from a science background where we are very open. So, you know, we get further together. That's kind of the credo of science. Like you work in a bubble, you don't really succeed. So when I came in, it was twofold for me. One, um, once I realized I, I had freedom in terms of like choosing text and information for my students, that was liberating. And then the next part was getting over the apprehension of like possibly making other people in the department upset if I went away from the fold because I was the very first person in my department to teach any biology course OER. So <clears throat> the thing is, if you are in introductory biology, the open material is there. You just have to adopt it. And since I was new to it, my number one focus is really understanding that in, in our field, textbooks can be very much cost prohibitive, right? They're really expensive, especially for like anatomy and physiology. So I was doing it because I knew there were students who were not buying the textbook simply because they had, with our student population, they had to choose between like some real world expenses or this textbook that, you know, I don't have to buy, I need it, but there are other things that I do have to have like electricity or a coat for my kid. And I don't think it's fair, right, that you should have to choose between that and getting an education if there's an option. And I found out about OER, so I did it. Right? The second part is, um, when, when you are um, starting out, I, I, didn't really, I didn't really look at success rates. You know, I, what I mean by that is, we just gave a talk at Open Ed last week. Yeah, it was last week, yeah. <laughs> and that, that was the first time I was really asked to look at success rates in my classes. And it turns out <coughs> that my DFW rates are the lowest amongst mm -hmm. all the sections taught. What I did notice before I did that, before we actually looked at the numbers, was that my classes are always full. So registration opened for us on October 15th, and every single one of my classes except one is already full and I have a wait list. And the one that is not full, it's interesting because I teach AMP, but I typically get the first half, AMP one, and I couldn't get the second half for a long time because I'm the low person on the totem pole. So people get it before me. So we made a little deal that if you, if you let me take the first half and the second half, I could fill the second half of the class because last semester, my students from the first half didn't go and take the second half. They, they didn't do it. So that was a triple section. And, then, and one of the sections only had nine students in it. So they, they dropped it for this coming spring down to two sections. I've already filled one and the other one's half full and registration hasn't even opened to some students yet, right? So, and, that, and because the whole thing is going OER now. 
You know, so it, it, it makes a difference. And, and faculty members know this. I'm, I'm curious, by the way, you are talking about enrollment and you are talking about the success rate. And uh, do you get criticism from your colleagues that maybe these people are coming to your course uh, because you are an easy grader or something <laughs> like that? Uh, and that's the reason it's, that many people are getting you know, so, such a high grade. You see, this, I, I actually give out less A's than all my other colleagues. Mm -hmm. But students pass, but they pass with like C's. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get an A, mm -hmm. right? And students agree that I'm, I'm tough in that respect. I really, and I don't get criticism from them. You know, I, the last thing, if you take one of my classes, the last thing the students say is, it's easy. Like, I, you know, because A&P is not easy. I think the big difference is, it's interactive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted I wanted to mention that as well. So I started teaching open um, uh, sources because Excelsior Online Writing Lab, Excelsior College, reached out to me and said, "Would you pilot this section of our open um, writing lab in your composition course? It's just the section on argumentation. We want to see if students who who use this do better." than the students who are using a, a traditional textbook. And so the Open Writing Lab has interactive quizzes that students can take. It has um, video tutorials. It's got a little game that students can play. Um, so it's just a lot of things that students really enjoy. So I ended up using it in my composition course for one semester. And I think there were nine other colleges that were doing it at the time. I don't remember what the success rate number was, what the statistic was, but I know that it was good, at, that it was, my students were more successful than they have ever been, and that was true of the other faculty who were doing it. And it was good enough that they published a paper and won an award um, based on it. So I continued to I continued to use it. They continued to build it out. And Sophia, that's what you were saying. It's not the textbook. I like to have mm -hmm. a print in my classroom because I want to be able to refer to the essays or let's look at this particular, you know, the wording of this particular sentence. But for something like composition, where I'm having them practice paraphrasing or they're reading about how to avoid plagiarism or where a correct comma, you know, where the correct comma placement is, these interactive tutorials that are, that are a benefit of a lot of these online resources that you just don't have with a traditional textbook is, I think, the reason why students yes. succeed because they have fun doing it. Um, and then you can bring it into the classroom. So I teach also a co-requisite course with, uh, so it's developmental students and traditional composition uh, students. So they work on it at home. So they might be working on, on a section called Grammar Essentials where they're playing around with commas and trying to figure out where they go and sample passages. In my classroom the next day, I can say, what did you understand or not understand? And we can pull it up on the smart board and do it together. Um, so, so it's it, it's a lot of it's just yes. fun, you know. Yeah. There's also a lot of studies that have shown um, that if you take so there was actually a big K-12 science whole science curriculum, but then there's also been part of my department studies, um, and John Hilton has a website that brings together a lot of this so you can actually read the data. But what they show is that, uh, and I'm not big on standardized testing, I'm sure you're not so totally surprised by that, but that on uh, department-wide standardized tests or district tests, uh, we have shown lots of benefits um, when switching to OER. So that's people switch to OER in one section and not in another, and then they take standardized yeah. um, departmental assessments and the OER sections do better. And, and I would say to, to your point, Robin, this past summer, I am, I'm friends with a person who works with a, a high school in Rochester <coughs> that is not a charter, but the high school was doing really, really bad. And to the point that the state actually turned it over to the University of Rochester. And this past summer, she asked me, because I was telling her about OER, they don't even know about it, mm -hmm. right? I told her how I think effective it is. She gave me 14 students who all fell the Regents exam for living environment. She gave me 14 students in two weeks, and then they all passed. Oh, wow. <laughs> so that's high school. <laughs> yeah. I'm a college teacher. That's yeah, that's yeah. great. So 14 <laughs> out of 14. In two weeks. Yeah. In two weeks. Yeah. You might also be kind of good. I've got, I've got a, one more question for the Oswego crew, but let's, let's hear from uh, the This is a kind of a different vein of a question. Right? One of the things I've heard since this uh, initiative in SUNY began was there were people who were uh, apprehensive in participation because they had deals with textbook 
uh, companies that took their stuff and turned it into uh, pack it, pack it in some way to sell it to the students, and they didn't want to, mm -hmm. they, they didn't want to mess with that. And I, 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 you know, there are some faculty from community colleges here. I, useful to know that's a barrier. <laughs> a barrier? I, I can't even get textbook publishers to visit the college. <laughs> I've been teaching a long time. Any of you that have taught for an extended period of time, more than 20 years, they used to be our best friends. Uh, they support a lot of our efforts. We'd spend time with them and we'd actually help them construct the textbooks. Now I get a call or an email. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure community college, ones at least that are the size of ours uh, at, at Tompkins Cortland, have that as an issue. Uh, the, the the question that I felt that you asked about uh, uh, you know the, the academic rigor uh, whether someone thought the course was easy I can't control whether they think I'm easy I get a sense after working a couple of times with Tori he's not easy just <laughs> successful uh, the real issue for us and uh, and I'm I I haven't taught many courses at a four year at, at a four year institution I taught for many years as an adjunct at, at SUNY Cortland. Uh, but my real interest in OER was as a result of sending four of my children to uh, <laughs> SUNY institutions. Uh, three of them made it through, and uh, one we're still working on, we're pushing a little bit harder. Uh, but it's not for, uh, for lack of, uh, of a textbook, because both their parents worked and they were able to pay for those textbooks. At our place, uh, that becomes the, uh, the the textbook is what we refer to as the uh, the stepsister. Everything is paid for out of tuition money, or everything is paid for out of financial aid money. We take it out, and at the end, whatever is left over for many of our students, for most of our students, is going to be that textbook money. So to answer your question, you know, is the text, my students don't even know what pedagogy is. I don't think they can pronounce it. But what they do know is they don't have textbooks. And they make the decision that a couple of us alluded to. Uh, for our students, daycare or, uh, or the textbook. Uh, paying for any kind of housing expense or food. You know, one of the fastest growing areas of our institution is the food bank. Uh, we've now tripled the size of it because yeah. students are hungry. The textbook is an expensive part, and uh, I will mention my uh, effort in a, with ATD. Please. Uh, we reduced the cost of our in our AAS program, NAS program. Uh, we envision it being about four thousand dollars a year, four thousand dollars for two and a half years. Uh, students come and take a lot of basic skills courses at our institution. We've reduced that now with a ten dollar fee. And we're unusual uh, having a fee. We're not zero, uh, and zero makes it sound like it's Kmart or Walmart. <laughs> but uh, we have a, a $10 college, and uh, we've now reduced the cost from about $4,000 to about uh, $270. If you work through the system, taking the OER courses, the ones that you're advised into or that you're able to ask questions. What's very cool about our place is you don't have to ask those questions uh, our programmers, we love these guys, what they've done is they have the OER uh, uh, icon next to the course. It explains what it is for those that don't know about it. It tells them to talk to their advisor. And uh, they choose courses based on that. And Sophia's right. Nobody was taking the courses. Uh, you don't have to take algebra to realize that something that costs less is going to benefit you. And that's what we found in our RAS program. And our enrollment issues are very obvious, I think, in, uh, at the community college level. This has kind of helped our program, the AS and the AAS program. So while we're seriously concerned sometimes about what the best way to bring information to people is, and we work on that every day as, as, uh, as accommodations, the real key is getting something in their hands the first day of class, mm -hmm. not two or three weeks into the semester, or when mm -hmm. book deferral is a book deferral, a name that a, a concept. <coughs> uh, that's when whatever money is left, it's released to you after four weeks, and then you can buy your textbook. <laughs> yeah. uh, and by then, a lot of them have decided, no, nah, I'm not going to do it. It's too. I managed to get this far without it. Oops, I guess I'm not going to get it. And a lot of them sell their textbooks mm -hmm. to get money before the end of the semester. 
So there's a lot of uh, stuff that, again, may be different from some of your experiences at the community college level. The ones that, it, the, the community colleges that have adopted this are uh, us, Herkimer, uh, some of the others that are, I guess you might say, demographically similar, meaning their students don't have a lot of money. And this is been a heaven sent for us. So Can we're I moving in the direction of understanding the academic value, please. but getting a book in a student's hand good, bad, or otherwise is a key part of this. So that's a great question. Thank you for asking. I want to add just one little piece, just with, within our own institution. As somebody who works with students who are on academic probation, um, this is a common discussion that I have with them about, you know, where are you situated in terms of your familiarity with different course materials? And it's a real common theme to have them struggling with either the monetary aspect of the textbooks not understanding the value or the place of it, and they don't necessarily appreciate the kind of risk situation that they're in if they're not getting the textbook, but then if they can't afford it, or I mean, all the various circumstances that we're talking about, um, they don't have the materials on the first day like they can with open educational resources, the deferral money that you're talking about, I mean, all these things come into play, and so from a retention standpoint, a success standpoint, this is one of the lurking variables that if we were to really think about it and address it and have certain tracks when it comes to advisement to make sure that people can have what they need day one of a course or even two weeks early when things are tagged, this is a powerful, it's a very potent um, preventative factor that we that we really have control over. I had a real, oh I'm sorry, go ahead. I had a real blind spot when I started teaching at the community college coming from a middle class family um, and never having had to think too much about textbook costs myself. It came right out of my financial aid and like a lot of 20 somethings when I was going to college I wasn't thinking about student loans and what that would cost, you know, how that would build up down the road. And so when students would come to my literature courses without their books, I would send them home because I would say, how am I supposed to, how are we gonna work on this together? It, you know, reference the passages if you don't have it. If you're a doctor, you don't go to an operating room without your medical equipment, so you can't come to class without the books, and so I would lose a lot of students. Never even occurred to me. It's a, you know, and I was thinking too, I was thinking back when I was buying books, oh, it was maybe like $30 for a textbook. And then a student one day came to me very crying and said, it's $75, this, you know, which, well, let your financial aid. Well, I don't have financial aid, you know? Um, and it just kind of blew my, like I realized in that moment just how much my privilege had blinded me from the choices I was making in terms of, of the textbooks. And when the publishers are coming to your and giving you the packages, you don't always ask the right kinds of questions. Um, so I don't send students away anymore. They all have their books day one. That's not a reason that they leave my classrooms anymore. So my, my retention is way up because of that, that single. I was just going to say, in, in, you know, in answer to Ramiz's point or question, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a logic textbook under contract, right? Or, and I hadn't written one before. So I think if I did, it'd be, there'd be an issue, right? Because you'd have material that maybe was under copyright with them and so on. But it makes me think on top of that that I, I can't believe there's any academics who think the publishers are our friends. You know, <laughs> It's such a scam, right? We do all the work and they, they just... It, some of them, as you know, are so exploitative, right? They charge so much money for the for the journal articles and so on that uh, it's delightful to think to have the opportunity to disintermediate, <laughs> right? It, it is, right? So I always say that too. Like, if you've got someone who's making, like, a, in your department, who's making huge money off of commercial textbooks that they wrote. Or, this is not for that guy. Just let him go. You yeah. know, like you, just let him go. You don't. You don't need everybody, right? There's plenty. There's so few academics getting rich off of academic publishing that most of us are perfectly happy, um, you know, to get a small stipend and compensated for our labor and do our do our work. Um, if you've got people who are just really opposed, you probably don't need them. You know, it's like it's yeah. things are changing um, quickly and there is momentum. I would start with the people who are either really psyched but can't find the time and resources mm -hmm. or the people in the middle who just don't understand mm -hmm. um, that when the publisher says inclusive access, it means not accessible and not inclusive, right? Um, because inclusive access is just a scam 
to use the language of open mm -hmm. to sell you things. And sometimes they're actually selling you OER that you can get mm -hmm. for free. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of amazing. But uh, people don't understand how it works. So explaining things and starting with the champions is better than spending time with people who are, and, you know. And I'll say, like, every little bit helps. So when I started, I, I couldn't even get a day section to, to pilot OER. I took it, had to take an even section of a class, you know, because we didn't know if it would work. And even if you, you, you know it should, right? And I have a lot of people who say to me, I'm just not sure. First of all, I tell them, you're teaching it. So if you're not comfortable with the material, like you haven't reviewed it, and you change it, change it first, but, but I had this question, how do I know it's good? You teach the class. <laughs> so if you can't read it and say whether or not it's good, yeah. we have another problem. <laughs> right? We have another problem. And, and well, I'm not going to make a difference. You will make a difference for every one of those students in your class. So I had to accept the fact that I'm not changing the world right now. I have 24 students who I'm impacting. Yeah. All right, and if you do that enough time, maybe other people will see it, and then maybe they'll want to get on board. And then you help them as much as you possibly can, because the nature of OER is to share. So now when faculty members come to me, I can't teach the day section now because I have all this other stuff going. But it turns out two day sections opened up for the spring, and the person who got them came to me and said, I want to take it OER. So I gave her everything. Right? I'm tutoring her. This is how you do it. Because I have 24, now she has 48. Mm -hmm. Right? And I've been doing this for a couple of years now. It's a process. Last year, she took a class that wasn't OER, a nutrition class, and she made it OER. And she normally gets like 16 students. She did it for 16 students. Right? That, that's the beauty of OER. You start where you start. Help as many as you can. If a part of it is OER, then you're helping. Mm -hmm. When I can't find good OER material, you know what they have to do? They have to get this text. And it does hurt me, but I don't compromise their education. Mm -hmm. If it is not good, don't use it. Mm -hmm. Write something new. Add to it. But I'm not, it's not just about cost savings. It's the fact that you can do it. It's just as good, and there's cost savings. So you got to put them together. Because they didn't come here just to save a dollar. Like, if you save them a dollar and they leave here and they don't know anything, we have failed. <laughs> um, I, I know that we're running short of time. I want to mention to you that we are thinking of publishers, but you should also be thinking of your bookstore. So it is very crucial that you maintain very good relationships with your bookstore. I was the first person who did OER with no book going to the bookstore at all. And I am also the only person who has kept very good relationships uh, with the bookstore in the level that when things change in business and history, I am copied in the email. And I'm not a chair of a program, and I'm not a dean, and I'm nobody. I'm just a faculty member. But I'm always getting copied. So I have managed to include the bookstore in, in ways that are not expected. Like maybe Larry has a book that some students would buy, but I have a book that is like a collection of things, and I still have something available for my bookstore to distribute to students. Yeah. So I think it is really important to engage your bookstore into the process and have them be prepared for what's about to happen and how you will approach the material and what material are you going to be offering. Sorry, I'm gonna cut, so I'm gonna ask one last question of our Oswego people specifically because that's who's mostly in the room. You know, we've got lunch in the back. This whole crew, I think, is gonna be around for the rest of the day, and I've got plans for putting them to work, so there will be more opportunities to engage because they're all brilliant, and it doesn't take long to scratch the surface. And and, <laughs> and um, the next thing that I do while we work on the afternoon is I'm going to go through and put links to each one of the resources that you're all using in the agenda document mm -hmm. so that you can go back and see 
what these people are actually up to and what they've done. But words of wisdom from the Oswego team. I, I get the sense that there's a lot of creation energy at Oswego. I know, Maya, you both adopted a book and created one, and Craig, you've clearly written one, and then uh, Kristen, of course. Um, but um, advice that you give, like um, who to look for, to for support, things not to do <laughs> here on campus, um, takeaways for before we eat lunch? Yeah, uh, use your librarians. <laughs> That's what I would say. Um, they have access to so many different platforms and, and just information that you had no idea was even out there. So use your librarians. They are a great resource. Um, also, I would say use your students. I think that's where I really am having the most success with the database that I'm creating. Um, the students are successful in that class because they have bought in in a whole new way because they're creating the content. They're like so excited and pumped about the quality of their work, which I, that that's what I'm seeing is the major difference. Um, where you know sometimes it's like oh I'll just you know I just need to pass. <laughs> but now they're like, oh, people are going to see it? Well, we need to make this really high quality. <laughs> so they're um, engaging in the uh, assignments in this new and fresh way and taking ownership in a way that is just really refreshing for me as their professor. Um, so use the students, use your library. Awesome. I guess I would say the same thing. Does that, does that mean you, Laura, basically? Or are you the, uh, <laughs> yeah, so we have resources here. And then does your, just can us Wiggle people call your team? Absolutely, yes. Uh, I don't know if you were like, no. <laughs> no. Oh, I will disclose. Um, but Laura, you will raise that too, right? Why do you have contact information? Right, yes, so I will for, all, for uh, this crew as well as myself. Um, and every conversation I have with anyone here at Oswego, I will include Laura, and unless you tell me not to, I can't imagine you want me to keep secrets from Laura. <laughs> Laura controls the money. <laughs> not that she's like dragging around in the wagon behind her, but um, you know, so she's got options for you locally, and so. Um, yeah, but absolutely, you can work with our team, and I'll tell you more about that after lunch. How about that for a cliffhanger? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> thank you so much for all of your participation. That went super fast. They always do. Thank you for sitting through lunch. And I know there are some out there, so put these guys to work during lunch as well. So thank you, thank you. Thanks. Thank you.